Hi, everyone, for those joining, we're just going to wait a second as the wait room kind of processes and everything. Uh, super happy to have you guys all back for our spring term of the workshop on entrepreneurial finance and, and innovation. Uh, we are excited to have Dan presenting his paper today and Bitsy discussing, uh, but we're going to give it another moment or two just to make sure everyone gets in. Um, a quick note on logistics, we're going to be doing about 40 minutes of Dan's uh, presentation and about 15 minutes with Bitsy, and then we'll have some time for Q&A Q at the end. But if you have questions throughout, go ahead and put those in the chat, and Dan's co-author will hopefully uh, graciously be able to, to answer some of those, but we'll also pause throughout uh, if there are any questions that we want to kind of interrupt Dan on. Um, last logistical thing, because this is Zoom and, you know, can be a bit of a void. We do encourage you all to put your cameras on if possible, just so that we can see everyone's smiling faces. Obviously, if you can't, that's totally cool. Um, but I think we are getting at 1202. So why don't we go ahead and take it away? Dan, we're super happy to have you present. Okay, well, Melanie and, and Mike and really the rest of the team too, thanks so much for including us in the program this, this spring, um, especially the inaugural Spring uh, WeFi WeFi talk. It's been a little, little uh, bit of time since I've given a virtual talk, so pardon me if I'm a bit rusty. Uh, but I think this will be a fun one. And my co-author Bob and Sampad, who's been working uh, together with me on a whole, whole portfolio of, of projects around really World War II R&D, is hanging out here as well. He can feel some comments in the chat, um, but happy to take questions along the way too. Uh, so, and and you know, as we get into this, let me give you a little bit of context. Um, and actually, even before then, thank Bitsy Perlman for being our, our discussion. So, so this paper has been a long time coming. I would say this project really kicked off almost eight years ago. And it took us this long to get this particular paper to a point where we think it's really rounded out. And what we're doing in this paper is taking newly digitized um, records of, of an agency which administered World War II uh, R&D, government R&D and looking to explore its long run effects on the US innovation system. Uh, we think this is interesting and important in its own right. Uh, there, there's a lot of historical writing on this episode and kind of drawing bridges to the post-war era, especially the emergence of a federal post-war science technology policy. Um, but, but even you know, beyond that, this is one of the few large systemic shocks to applied R&D in US history. And whereas you know, most research that studies the effects of public R&D investment you know, often focuses on marginal changes using idiosyncratic uh, funding rules and different modern programs, this is different, right? This, this, what we're studying, and you'll see me walk through the history a bit more, uh, was really more of kind of a, a, a ground shifting event. And it's driven by uh, immediate military needs, um, it has maybe some more analogy to some modern programs that are being introduced and debated today, which I'll talk about. Um, uh, and, and so, so let's see what we can try to learn from this. So um, I think I'll just start with a little bit of introduction here. Let me give you some context. We're going to go back uh, really to June 1940 as the story kicks off. Um, and so you have in June 1940, war is already raging in Europe. The U.S., of course, is not yet at war. Uh, Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor didn't happen until December 1941. But already in June 1940, with the Maginot Line falling in France, uh, U.S. policymakers and observers are starting to recognize the U.S. may be drawn into this war. In light of that, uh, in, in June, a coterie of uh, U.S. Science, leading scientists and scientific administrators score a meeting with President Roosevelt to propose the creation of a National Defense Research Committee. And uh, you know, who, who's you know, in this, they're proposing that the government um, fund civilian R&D in military technology. Uh, this evolves into a broader agency, the U.S. Office of Scientific Research and Development, the OSRD, which you'll see me reference over and over again in this paper. And it's hard to overstate how much of a change this was from the status quo ante when the U.S. didn't before the war really have any serious role in funding um, research and development. Uh, you know, there was 
It had some position in agriculture. There was some intramural research at military research laboratories, but no extramural programs like this and nothing really at scale. And so we have what goes from a new agency on a one-page proposal to a 1,500-person, multi-billion dollar in today's dollars effort to harness civilian science technology for the war. Um, and, and so this, th th this, for its time, was an unprecedented experiment. Over the course of the war, OSRD entered into over 2,000 RD contracts with a mix of industrial and academic research institutions, uh, industrial firms, and, and universities. And what came out of this effort was a, a wide-ranging set of, of technological advances that had immediate military value, but, but also, after the war, uh, civilian dual use fillers. And so in this set, you have you know, advanced, key advances in radar, electronics, of course, atomic fission, uh, jet propulsion, but also on, on, on the medical side, OSRD was involved in military medicine. You have uh, the first mass produced penicillin, uh, vaccines, antimalarials, pesticides, and so much more. We, of course, have, have, have uh, characterized this in, in the paper. And so while this was key to the Allied war effort, for our purposes, what's even more exciting is that this was one of the largest and farthest reaching shocks in the history of the US innovation system. And you can see that just by the numbers. I'll introduce the data behind this in just a little bit, but uh, this is showing you the government funded share of US patents over time, really from the 1930s onwards. And this just brings into focus how much of a sea change World War II was in terms of the government's position in domestic invention. Uh, with at the peak of the war, government funded research accounting for almost 12% of US patenting. All right, so behind this effort, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about him too, is a, a name many of you might recognize, Vanny Barr Bush, uh, at the time coined the general of physics. Um, he, he was directing and, and ultimately kind of the, 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 um, uh, the visionary behind the OSRD operation uh, that yielded the, the, this whole broad range of uh, inventive outputs that I just described a second ago. Uh, not only that, though, a second, and this is where we get a bit more into the institutional history here that's really interesting and actually quite important as we think about institutional changes in science and, and technology policy today. Um, this experience was really the platform, let's say the, the, the reference point that motivated the emergence of a post-war research policy, which Bush articulated in the, the now famous report, Science Stainless Frontier. Um, and although the post-war institutional arrangement didn't quite reflect, didn't quite take the shape that Bush had proposed, it was largely inspired and, and really juiced by, by this. Um, so, all right, that gives you a, a bit of context here. The question of the paper that we really want to get a handle on is how this surge in applied, federally funded applied R&D changed the U.S. innovation system. And we have four main findings. We just get them all out in front of us and we'll start to walk through some of the details uh, in the time we have left. The first finding is that World War II catalyzed the takeoff of technology clusters across the country. And by the numbers, the top quartile of treated clusters, and here to us, a cluster we define as others have before, as a county, really a, a geography crossed by a technology area. So it's, for example, semiconductors in Silicon Valley, or um, computers and electronics in the Boston area, or it could be aerospace in Los Angeles, or et cetera, right? Um, the top quartile of treated counties was by 1970, producing 50% uh, uh, more patents relative to untreated clusters, and that's without any sign of pretrends before the war. A second result, as we try to understand what could have driven the sustained impact, is that it does not appear it was contingent on continued public R&D investment. It's not that the water needed continued gardening and fertilization, although this helped, but really we see this organic takeoff in these, in these places, um, in these clusters, as a result of this shock. 
uh, we then try to take that further downstream and think about how does it affect any real economic outcomes. And we find a relationship with local industrial employment growth and even with firm creation in related high tech industries. And really at the heart of this story, just to kind of bring this to, into focus, are electronics and communications. I, you know, you think about the post-war era and what was high tech of that time? And that's really where the action was. And World War II was um, fundamental to, to uh, the US pivot towards those fields. And, and, and that's actually what we show at the very end of the paper is as we try to think about how this rolled up to any aggregate effect, that's where we see them. We see that World War II um, drove a shift in the direction of US invention towards those subjects. All right, uh, just to, to position this a little bit, uh, I often in short talks don't do a literature review, uh, but, but here I think it can be helpful. What are some of the themes that this speaks to? There's public R&D and its effects on innovation. There's the geography of innovation, especially with respect to agglomeration, but, but even more so, think about how R&D shocks themselves may affect agglomeration. That's kind of a subject. There's a lot of work that shows that agglomeration is good for innovation, not as much that kind of documents what might drive agglomeration, and in particular, you know, how endogenous growth cycles might be triggered, um, which is really the under, undercurrent of this paper. And then of course, there's a literature on defense R&D and impact of war and our, our paper fits in here too. Um, and you know, I think I'll go ahead and move on into, into the meat of this and, and just briefly here say that as, as I said in the beginning, this is really distinctive. This is a systemic shock. We have long run outcomes that we can study here. And what we really wanna know is can a transient R&D funding shock of this scope and scale have sustained effect? And that's what we'll start to unpack. Okay, uh, I'll pause here if there are any questions uh, before I push forward, it's a good chance to break. Feel free to jump right in. And if not, I'll keep moving us along. At least nothing in the chat so far. I think you've been okay. super clear, so. Wonderful, okay. okay. Thank you, everybody. Great. Um, so we've covered some of the history and uh, you know, what, what is useful to, to put into focus here is think about what's different in war for, for wartime R&D. Instead of being driven by, let's say, commercial opportunity um, or, or technological potential, we're really talking about a demand-driven push for investment in specific technologies that address military problems. That makes it applied by nature. At the time, there really was no time for basic research. Um, the the you know people running this the show really had to take the basic sciences given and put it to work uh, and moreover uh, we have engage uh, th this program engaging both universities and academics uh, as well as firms and for that matter actually connecting them together and then further to the battlefield with with, with military users so you have this kind of integrated model of r d that includes uh, production and diffusion as they sought to not only get this stuff developed, but also into production and then into the field. And we've written a lot more about that in, in some separate work. It's really interesting and, and actually an interesting, uh, not only precedent for modern R&D, uh, public R&D program, uh, but, but also for modern, let's say, um, emergent issues, uh, especially crisis problems like a pandemic. But we'll, we'll you know, reference our, you know, I'll point to our other work for that. Uh, so, so, okay, how did this actually take place? You know, I've mentioned the broad set of contractors across sectors, but in the course of this undertaking, you have thousands of scientists and engineers across the country being mobilized into wartime R&D. Uh, firms occupy, you know, generally play a specific role in this endeavor which is in later stage development and you know, say production of uh, you know, early production runs, field testing, things like that. It's really at the heart of the story is a network of university-based large central laboratories like uh, the MIT Radiation Laboratory, the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, APL still exists today. Um, Caltech JPL, which existed for a little bit before the war, but was really 
really scaled up during the war. You know, these were organizations that were generally stood up. They didn't exist before. They were stood up for the war. They drew a lot of people in. They focused on specific things. Um, the Rad Lab grew to 4,000 people from really, again, just a starting set of 20 or 30. And they, 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 they kind of ran, in, in some sense, were, were the engine behind these R&D programs. Um, and that's important to keep in mind as we think about where this paper will go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and move us forward and, and skip the discussion of Science English Frontier. If you want to read about it, it's super interesting. Uh, maybe if we have time at the end, we can come back to it too. All right, so this, this project wouldn't be possible without archival data. And for those of you who have done historical work, you know that you can have really rich, uh, really you know, rich resources if you look to the historical record and, and try to think about what you can learn using that information. For this paper, we're using essentially the complete record of OSRD, which includes all contracts, all contractors, all inventions produced under those contracts and patents on those inventions. We also have in our data, all research articles, those are primarily biomedical, and we'll be using them not in this paper, but a different one, um, as well as a lot of rich contextual information. I mean, letters from the desk of Danny Barr Bush to everyone from President Roosevelt, to his deputies, to um, the, the patent commissioner, and et cetera. I think things that really help fill in a lot of color on what took place. Those records, in particular, let's say contract records, might look like this. This is the contract index card. It shows a particular contract you can see at the bottom to RCA. You can see the total value of this contract, $895,000 in obligations. Uh, for that same contract, this is a contractor car. Uh, this is a rather, this is an invention reported, deflection oscillator. You can see its serial number. You can connect the serial number to a granted patent. And it, this is what we will take forward, as you'll see in a second, and use productively. So we take all of these archival records, we digitize them, and uh, we then connect that to a lot of other things. First is the complete US patent record, plus some international patenting. Uh, we also collected data on NSF grants since the agency's founding uh, in 1950, on FFRDCs from the 1950s and 1970s, defense R&D contracts, individual level data on the scientific workforce in the 1960s, county business patterns, uh, done in Bradstreet establishment level data, um, you know, as we really try to understand what took place after World War II that explains why it had such long-lived effects. Now, it turns out that some of those federal R&D spending records um, are tough to tie to the data we have, but there's something that supersedes them that is the reason this project took an extra two years, is that we collected data on all government interest patents since the 1930s. Um, I'll, I'll show you some examples of that in just a few slides. To give you a flavor of what, uh, excuse me, of what took place um, uh, under OSRD's, uh, under its direction, this table is showing you some of the, um, the, the patent classes in which it had the uh, largest presence. In particular, that comprised the largest share of OSRD's portfolio of patents. At the top, you see a lot of things related to radar and electrical communication. Of course, you also see ordnance, ammunition, explosive, nuclear energy is, is near the top. Um, but what we also show in this table, if you look to the very right of it, is just how different this was from the shape of US innovation before the war. Both of these priorities pushed in a different direction than where uh, US invention was at the time. And that's important for our purposes as we'll talk about in terms of what the shock really was. It also had geographic variation. This is showing you uh, with, with bubbles proportional to the number of patents, the location where these inventions were produced. Um, and you can see there's quite a bit of geographic heterogeneity. And that takes us really into our first set of results. And to motivate this, let me give you an example. And uh, this example, I think, brings into focus what this paper even does. You're looking right now at the time series of aggregate patenting in 12 uh, Massachusetts counties from 1935 to 1965. The line at the top is Middlesex County. That's where Cambridge is, MIT and Harvard, for example. 
And you know, looking at this figure, there are a couple of things you can see. First is that um, Middlesex was producing more patents in levels throughout this period, but it wasn't really particularly on a different time trend or real, any time trend prior to the war. You see this big spike in patenting in Middlesex during the war. You see a return to baseline afterwards, but then you see this post-war takeoff. This is the pattern we're really bringing out in this paper. It turns out we'll see that this generalizes across the country, but you can dive in even further. So if we look within Middlesex and we look at specific technology areas, high level technology areas, one digit NBR patent categories, uh, these are the time series of patenting within Middlesex in each of those categories now indexed to 1935. So one here is the 1935 level. And here, I mean, you can visually see the nature of the shock itself. You can see that, let's say, in, in computers and communication. And behind this, let me be clear, is really radar and radar-related invention uh, because MIT hosted the Radiation Laboratory, which was the nexus for radar development during World War II. You see this huge spike in, in patenting. It's really a 30-fold increase during the war. A return, again, a, a, a retraction to near pre-war levels. And then you see that takeoff. You see a more attenuated, similar pattern in electrical and electronics. And, and, and again, our goal for this paper, for this part of it, is to try to blow this out to the rest of the country in a systematic way and see whether this generalizes. And so that's, that's what we do. So our approach here really, will we looking at the cluster level, again, that's county cross by technology. It, it's effectively a, a difference in difference um, before and after the war in more versus less intensively treated clusters. And uh, the, the, our definition of a cluster here is counties by two digit NBR categories, which I think is about the right level of aggregation for, for what we're looking to do. Um, but yeah, we have alternatives that we run to and it's, it's similar. And you know, in, a nut, in, in, in one slide, if you remember nothing else from this talk, I want you to remember this slide right here, because this is essentially the effect of OSRD at the cluster level. Uh, so regressing cluster patenting over time, so annual cluster patenting on the scale of the ORCD shock, which here we're measuring as the fraction of cluster patenting of the 1940s that OSRD was responsible for, that it funded. Uh, so in other words, it's kind of a measure of how intensively the local innovation system was engaged in wartime R&D. We see that right up until 1941 or so, there's no particular trend, no, so no differential trend in more intensively treated clusters. We can see that OS3D bump during the war, a little bit of that retraction, and then you see this sustained takeoff. Um, and we can show this in other cuts too. So let's, let's say, let's look at just non os patterns. You see that os bump in the middle of the 1940s, it's attenuated, that's on the left. On the right, if we look at non-government interest patents, which the data for that, I'll, again, I'll show you in a second, we see that that, that mid-war bump is missing, but that sustained takeoff is just as much there. Uh, we can show this in other ways. If we compare the top quartile of treated clusters by that intensity measure, we, uh, and, and the reference group here, the omitted category is untreated clusters. Yeah, we can see that by the late 1960s, they're producing 50 to 60 more patents, uh, percent more patents per year than, uh, than, than untreated clusters. Uh, let, me, let me go ahead and, and in the interest of time, keep moving us forward. So that, that's a result that we actually had pretty early. What, what really took us time to resolve is getting a better read on why this transient shock had such long-lived effects. And, um, and there are a few things you can think about here. The most natural hypothesis might be direct impacts. You could have direct follow-on innovation to OSRD invention. You might have continued patenting by OSRD contractors, elevated patenting, or by individuals involved in the research effort. It turns out 
these do not explain that that increase. I'll save the evidence for the paper, but yeah, we've run cuts across all these dimensions, and that's not sufficient. I mean, there's actually no the the the, the growth, the post-war growth, is driven by firms, inventors um, that weren't involved in OSD work, and by patents that don't cite OSD work, for example. So we don't think it's that. Uh, a second hypothesis is continued federal R&D investment. I mean, as I said in the beginning, uh, World War II was this sea change event for federal R&D policy. And especially as you transition into the Cold War era, uh, you see an elevated um, role for not only government, but especially defense R&D in the broader system. And, and so one thing you might conjecture is that actually that sustained push is what drove these, these takeoffs. And to understand whether that's the case, we really need systematic measures of government-funded invention um, to, to make some, some cuts. So where can we get that? Well, one possibility is a Fleming et al. science paper, which introduced um, new data on government supported invention. They collect this from a mix of patent assignees and government interest statements that they programmatic algorithmically read in the text of patent documents. It turns out though, this misses a lot of patents, especially historically and particularly because a lot of patents were produced by government contractors who kept title. So they're the assignees, their names are on the patent and they don't include government interest statements. And so these aren't observable in the patent record itself. Instead, there's an administrative record of all of these inventions, and there are a lot of them. I mean, they're you know, well over 100,000. And so we set out to find these records, and we did. And so, for example, I mean, we'll, we have, it, it's technically named the government register. So it's a register of government interest patents. And the, the records of these things, especially historically, are stored in boxes at the National Archives, like this. This is, you know, patents assigned to the army. Uh, these are, on the other hand, patents that the army funded, but had license to, or where the contractor kept title. And it's, you know, what's in that box on the right that isn't really otherwise easily observed. And, and again, there are a lot such, there, there are many such boxes. And so they become a critical input to this project. And so these boxes have index cards, like what you're looking at here, here's William Shockley, uh, with a pulse generator developed at Bell Labs during the war. This is probably radar related. You have Enrico Fermi's um, uh, nuclear chain reacting systems. Originally, it, um, you know, the, the funding agency was marked OSRD, but, but later AEC because AEC kept title. Um, that's the Atomic Energy Commission for those who, who have forgotten. Uh, you have you know, the Navy, you have the Air Force, and, uh, and so these become important inputs for us. And you know, as we, for example, cut the sample across clusters that had high versus low government funded patenting intensity. So where a large or, or small fraction of post-war patents were government funded, we see similar results either way. And so it looks to us like post-war federal R&D investments don't explain these sustained impacts that we're, we're finding. Instead, uh, what it looks like really took place is what you could say is kind of a, a, a virtuous cycle of agglomeration and endogenous growth in the counties and technologies that OSRD touched. And we have a lot of evidence in the paper that, that walks through this. We document, for example, um, there is growing activity by firms that were already active in those clusters, by firms that migrate from um, other clusters in the same location, or that migrate from the same technology in other locations, so they migrate in geographically. New entrants, you see increasing citation flows, you see um, a, a range of other effects that are consistent with agglomeration, um, you know, they have kind of a Marshallian story here, that we think is the story of the paper. Um, all right, so, you know, I can push forward. I actually want to check the time too. How are we doing on time? 
Oh, we got 10 minutes. We're, we're doing okay. Um, anyone, uh, anybody want to pop in for a question? This is a good time to do it. If Bob is handling the chat, then thanks. I think Bob's been doing a good job. So I think Bob, uh, yeah, Bob, yeah. you're the man. Awesome. Um, okay, very good. So let, let's take this forward. I mean, oh, that is fascinating to us, especially both as scholars in the economics of innovation. But, but, but broadly, I think there's more that we and, and others want to know. And something we were pushed on early is how does this actually affect real economic outcomes? Get a handle on this. Uh, what what we do, what we want to know is really does this eventually create jobs or new businesses? To get at this, here's what we do. Yeah, you know, we have we've been working so far with patent data. We want to pull this over to industrial activity. USPTO provides a crosswalk of some patent classes to to a number of SIC industries. And having spent time with that crosswalk, it's not perfect. Obviously, there, you know, these are different classification systems for different things. But in some subsets of the space, they're actually not bad. They're, they're, I know, you could even say pretty good, not perfect, but, but reasonably good. And I think one area where they do reasonably well is in communication, conveniently in communications and electronics and, and, and the electrical field more broadly, because there you have kind of a well, you know, more well-defined technology space and a more well-defined industry space. And so what we're going to do is focus on uh, industries um, that, that this crosswalk covers that are in that domain. And that allows us to map the shock, which we measure at, you know, in, in patent data at the technology class level or cluster level to industrial activity at the county by industry level. We have from county business patterns, which um, unfortunately begins post-war, so we don't have a pre-war comparison to post-war to make with those, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about if, you know, in just a second. But, but even so, with county business patterns data, we can compare across, let's say, counties and industries with differential OSRD activity during the war, what their employment numbers look like uh, decades later. And using Dun & Dun Bradstreet data, which, yes, have limitations, which we're well familiar with, we can talk about perhaps at the end, we take the 1980 DNB release, which includes the stock of firms in Dun and Bradstreet in that year, includes their founding years. And there we can actually look at firm creation uh, across the decades. We'll go from 1920 to 1980, really. And think about in counties and industries which, which had more OCD activity, do you see firm creation growing more quickly? Uh, over over that time, and the short answer is yes and yes. So this is the CBP data. This is industrial employment and uh, related high tech manufacturing industries. Um, those that had yeah, so so counties and, and industries that had OCD patents uh, related to them or had a higher intensity of OCD treatment, you see they have higher employment in 1980. If we turn to the DNB data where we're looking at uh, firm creation, so call it startups, if you will. By the extensive measure, there's a little bit of a pre-trend right here for the 1930s, but it's not huge. But then you see a real, a real jump in the later decades in, in firm creation. Um, and by the intensive measure, it's even stronger without pre, it, it, or it's about, about, you know, by the magnitude, it's about the same without pre-trend. So, so uh, you know, that leads us to believe that, yeah, this actually filtered downstream into industrial activity. And then finally, the last set of results uh, uh, for the paper, we want to understand, does this have aggregate implications? And to evaluate this question, we, uh, here we pull in foreign patenting data too. We want to understand, did this shift the direction of US invention? We can compare US invention to foreign invention, let's say important pat foreign patent offices, like in the UK or France, other allied countries, or we can compare patents filed at USPTO by American versus foreign inventors in more and less intensively treated technology uh, categories before and after World War II. And uh, here again, um, 
we're here now we're using IPCs because we have foreign patenting that we need to be able to have a harmonized patent classification for. But but so here here again, we see, excuse me, broadly consistent effects. Excuse me. Um, you know, going from relative to untreated um, technology areas, as you move forward into the most intensively treated ones, treated by OSRD, that is, you see a real difference in the level of US versus foreign invention um, in the post-war era. Whether you're comparing USPTO filings to UK or French uh, patent office filings, or uh, this is a slight typo in, in, in the caption, but, um, or no, rather this, this is fine, right? You could do, you could do um, the actual annual estimates uh, and so you can look for pre-trends, right? We don't see a particular pre-trend, um, but then you see the sustained elevated uh, you know, level of patenting in the US versus abroad. Uh, so, so that is, that kind of wraps up our, our results. Um, in the couple minutes that we have here, you know, we have just a couple left. Let's back it out to what some of, of the broader implications of this are. So now, if you take a step back from everything we've seen so far, what do we get from this paper? You know, what, what's, what's our payoff? Um, the immediate payoff is understanding the impacts of the war itself, of OSRD. And we have this nice quote from a retrospective on the wartime research effort by its secretary, really a deputy to Vannevar Bush, that the full impacts of its work must await the judgment of the future. This, we think in many ways, is part of that judgment, provides the first real systematic empirical assessment of the long run effects of this unique experiment in research policy. And you know, we, we show a variety of really foundational effects on the US innovation system. Um, some of the clusters that, that were kind of catalyzed into, into existence or into growth, they still exist today. Um, key among them is, is, is the Boston Route 128 region. You know, the, 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 there's a well, well-trodden, well-told story of Route 128 in the computing and, and electronics era. It's, of course, now evolved even, even further. Uh, biotech is a post-war story, not a not a wartime story. Um, but Silicon Valley has roots in World War II. Uh, Central New Jersey had a thriving electronics industry in in the post-war era. Um, in in many ways, tracing to World War II era work. Um, and you know, embedded there are actually questions of why is Silicon Valley in California and not in Central New Jersey? That's a question for for you know, I guess future research, not not this paper, but but those questions are out there, and, and I think not fully resolved, even so. So yeah, we think it's interesting in its own right, but beyond history for its own sake, you know, there are a lot of things we get from this. Uh, we we think that that we think are still relevant today. So there's growing interest right now in um, enlarging the applied R and D portion of the federal R and D portfolio. Uh, particularly in civilian R&D, the military has, has for a long time had a big hand in applied R&D, but on the civilian side, uh, the government hasn't so much. And this is reflected in modern policy uh, uh, efforts or, or changes like the CHIPS Act, which, so the Chips and Science Act, which adds an explicit technology director to the NSF, ARPA-H, which is just getting off the ground, uh, the COVID-19 response, which we've written about and there's more to think about. Uh, moreover, this really speaks to the themes that are, are tied up, implicated in, in, in these policy changes around innovation and regional inequality. And these have been long simmering changes that are you know, once again, becoming really pretty, pretty salient in US innovation policy. And so with the last minute here, I'll just tell you that if you go back to the 1940s, um, so don't worry about this slide right now, let me just, give you some storytelling. And Bob, and by the way, can do this so much better than I can. You know, coming out of the war, uh, there was ongoing congressional and policy debate over what shape post-war research policy should take, um, you know, which agencies should be responsible for which activities. 
and how, for example, federal R&D investments should be distributed among, let's say, elite scientists versus a broader distribution, um, elite institutions, whether scientists should, should have uh, really the ultimate say in what gets funded versus whether it should be under political direction. Um, and these controversies were born out of tensions during World War II, for example, uh, hesitation that OSRD was actually had a relatively concentrated portfolio, as opposed to engaging the really the, the, the complete inventive resources that the country might have had to offer. Uh, Harley Kilgore in particular, a, a um, senator of, uh, from West Virginia, New Deal Democrat, was the most vocal critic of OSRD in this sense, presented a competing vision for, for the NSF and you know, kind of more broadly post-war research policy to Van of our Bushes. Um, and, and a lot of the, you know, the themes of those debates of that era. Now, one other one I can give you is, you know, who should bear fruit to federally funded research? Should performers, for example, keep, con keep title to patents they produce or should the government, right? No, these, are, these are questions that still uh, dog us today and are becoming all the more, um, I think, topical with recent policy movements that we hope this paper at least can speak to what some impacts of large applied public investments in R&D can produce. So with that, I am going to tie this off and pass it over to Bitsy. Thanks again for hanging out and let's, uh, let's take any questions at the end. Awesome, thank you, Dan. Uh, Bitsy, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. All right, thank awesome. you so thank much. You. <clears throat> uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me to, to talk about this. Um, I'm at the tail end of COVID right now, and I know everyone's experience with COVID is different and whether it's gonna be mild or severe for you is, is really unpredictable, but for me, it's been a, a pretty rough last week. Um, so, you know, just putting that out there uh, at the beginning. I had then spent the last week reading this paper, and I know if you, Dan sort of flipped through this very quickly, but if you looked at it, there was, Gross and Sampat A, B, C, D. Uh, and so they have written so many different papers on this set of topics. I teased Dan at one point that I thought they were writing a book. I will reiterate, I think they are in fact writing a book if they aren't entirely sick of this topic, uh, you know, when they can stomach it. Um, but, you know, I, it was a, an enjoyable thing to be spending my, my time and attention on. So to retread some of what Dan went over already, um, this was a huge uh, shock into in technology development, right? So the government funding in technology development before this uh, just was nothing like this at all. And this definitely dwarfs the Cold War funding and the space race and modern funding and technology, um, although, those systems much look much more like it than uh, the 1920s and, and pre-war era of technology development. We knew, know that one of the things that was true about this, and Dan showed this as well, that the government invested in places that were already producing uh, a lot of these technologies. So in some sense, we're already the winners. Um, but these places didn't seem to be significantly different in trends than previous places. And this shock really made a trend change in those places, even though it was already selecting the winners. Um, and this really establishes the, the post-World War, um, you know, sort of world. You know, I think of this as the world I live in. You know, one of the things that really strikes me, and this is from the appendix, if you look at the universities that get this investment, like MIT and Caltech really just swamp everyone else. Like these institutions were before this certainly important institutions, but this investment in MIT and Caltech really makes them into sort of the startup ecosystems that they are today in a way that um, you know, people I think at the universities themselves appreciate and sort of understand when they think about how much funding is in it. But I think outside of the universities, we don't necessarily appreciate the degree to which this was just a 
huge, massive investment in particular to these technical schools. Um, and then I also pulled out this paper from one of one of Damon Sampat's other papers, which looks specifically at the uh, patent classes that um, patents that were from the Rad Lab and the radio uh, laboratory, which is at Harvard. So these were sort of paired laboratories uh, brought in. So they had radio wave antennas, which I put on uh, the top there. You can see your sort of satellite dish uh, that you might recognize from satellite TV. Um, you had direct radio systems uh, devices, which right there is a radar device. So, you know, we don't think too much about radar devices, except in sort of military um, sort of war movie technology. But in fact, radars are super necessary to landing planes, period, right? Like to have my plane get onto the ground safely in the modern world involves radar. And that's really important to us. Um, of course, this was uh, using microwave transmission. So I put a picture of a microwave there. And, you know, I Dan even had a quote of somebody in the, the paper. I guess I shouldn't, I shouldn't, Dan, Dan and Bobbin, one of them chose a quote um, of, you know, looking at the importance of this to wireless technology in turn, like cell phones. Right, so this, this technology really has these far reaching implications, um, which you know, may have, of course, come out a bit without this investment, but like really touch huge areas of our life that we don't necessarily think of. So I wanna emphasize that aspect of it. So Dan showed this figure where we had this, you know, huge uh, increase in patents in these treated areas. You see this World War II bump and then, then this increase. And then Dan was like, oh, we had these results early on, but didn't focus on the fact that panel A and panel B, I think, really preview what they're going to find with the um, importance of these being generalize effect, right? So, you know, we're worried about government investment. Dan showed this split between low government investment and, and high government investment places. Another way to think about like, is this government investment is to just take out all these government interest patents, which is what they do in panel B, and you still get this huge takeoff. And it's nice that in both of these cases, you really don't have the OSRD direct effect. And so you can see that they're pulling out this OSRD direct effect, and yet they're still getting this huge takeoff. Um, and I'll pause here to say that this, this data set that they've collected on government interest patents is, I think, a really fascinating data set. Um, and I hope they can both come up with neat new things to do with it, because it's just a, a tremendous snapshot of what the government has invested in in the mid-century that I think is new and unique to the world. So I'm happy to see uh, functional. And then they look a little bit um, sort of at pushing at this. They try to, you know, nail down, is this government investment or not? And, and they showed those things. And then they think about this startup ecosystem. Um, and Sudan so framed this as startups. And I, I don't think that's quite the right framing, actually. I think this is survival. Um, and, and survival is a weird thing because it's both startups and it's, you know, do you continue? And so I'm actually not as concerned about seeing a pre-trend in the 1930s as one might be if I thought about this as pure startups, because you could imagine that, you know, uh, firm that started in 1935 has some probability of dying before the war. And then the war comes in and it decreases its probability of dying. And so now that you could see this real pre-trend that's weak, and I'm happy to see that it's relatively weak, um, because it's having an impact because it's being traded at, I don't know, age seven or whatever um, on survival. And so, you know, I think that it's often hard, and I've thought about this a lot because I work with the business dynamic statistics, to really think about what to make of a cross-section of firms that have survived in particular 
in this case um, to fairly late ages. Um, but the fact that there are so many firms that have managed, like the 1940s firms that have managed to make it through 40 years tells you that these were really uh, strong firms um, that were able to, to do quite well. And I would be curious, um, I imagine in the Dun & Bad Street data, you also probably have a sense of their size. And so sort of to, to like pull this survival thing a little bit, Further, I would be curious about this like size cross decade um, version of this to get a sense of, you know, are the firms that did manage to survive from the 1940s also bigger than firms in other areas? You know, um, can you think about like the treatment intensity in sort of their, their firm size or how quickly they grew? Um, obviously, how quickly they grew is, is not right for the older firms, like the older firms have reached a mature size. Um, anyways, the, the point is they show that this shock has this very large effect on um, creating these startup ecosystems and on firm survival. And they have another thing which I have not pulled out, which also looks at um, the distribution of patenting in these areas and how it really disperses it across more than the top firms, which is very cool. Um, one thing that they don't really focus on, but does exist in the paper, is there is some evidence of displacement of technologies. Um, and so I was surprised that there wasn't like a footnote that said something about this. Uh, and I thought, because I think it is also interesting when thinking about the direction of, of technology, you know, in some places you don't see displacement, but there are at least two of these graphs that, that seem to suggest that places that didn't get these investments seem to not, seem to sort of move away from uh, investing in these technologies that OSRD was investing in. Um, and I think that seems very reasonable. You know, if all the love is going to MIT and Caltech, you can see why Michigan State would say like, oh, our reasonable thing to do is to just like focus on what's our comparative advantage. And so, um, you know, some might say that this is like a problem or a threat to identification, but I, I really don't think it is. I think it's a description of the world. Um, and I think it is also amazing how weak this, this evidence of displacement also is. So it's not enough to say it's none, but it's definitely like, it's only the places that really aren't, you know, it's only the bottom half of places. And even then it's only the bottom 25% of places that you might say like, they seem to be having some displacement effect. Uh, so I thought that was a very cool result that didn't get uh, explored as much as it could have been. Uh, and then I just had some sort of generalized thoughts about this paper. You know, so the paper is really about how World War II created the America that I live in and the America that I live in, you know, I live in, in the Boston metro area. So like dominated by this particular startup ecosystem, dominated by small companies, dominated by, uh, within physics research, national labs, and large, uh, large investments there um, by government grant making with all of the sort of um, uncertainty that goes along with that. Uh, and, you know, I, I started wondering a few things, which is one, were there any alternative systems proposed during the war for how this could be done? And I know Dan previewed at the end of this that there was a debate um, about how to fund this and sort of the New Deal wing was really worried about distributional impacts and you know further lost Einsteins um, and people who weren't you know getting their ideas met but I wasn't sure if they had like actual um, ideas that would have worked in a, a crisis innovation situation where it really does feel like doubling down on the winter winners is in fact going to be your most fruitful, you know, way to win the war uh, quickly. Um, where sort of 
distributional questions kind of go out the window. Um, and sort of following on that, you know, this, this choice was then to pick these technologies that were ready to go. And the question then is, does this serve in peacetime? You know, and, and I think Vandevar Bush was really expressing in the Endless Frontier that they built on this foundation of basic science uh, in order to, um, you know, have these things that were ready to go. Um, and that when you were in peacetime, you should go back and you should invest in basic science. And the problem with investing in basic science is that it's extremely non-directed. You don't know what the fruits of art are be, and you don't gonna, you aren't going to know about what the time horizons for invest it, investing in it are. So I, I this week have been thinking a lot about AIDS research, right? Because COVID has seen these huge benefits from from AIDS research. Um, Paxlovid, which is of course um, an AIDS developed or half an AIDS developed antiviral, um, and then you know mRNA vaccines, which you know, has now benefited me hugely for COVID, but of course for AIDS has not actually turned in any, into any functional vaccines yet because it turns out that HIV is just particularly um, difficult. And so, you know, just, I think maybe the answer here with the peacetime investment question is that there, there is no obvious direction, but as we sort of think about science versus technology policy, you know, that's a, that's a question I was meditating on with these things. Um, I promised Dan one line that said, and write another paper. So here's my line that says, write another paper, which is, uh, they wrote a paper specifically on how the Rad Lab and the RRL um, went into innovation ecosystems. So I'm curious how this differs from the more diffuse disease work. And in particular, what are the follow-on innovation ecosystems that came out of the work that focused on um, penicillin and malaria? Um, and does that have implications for how the NIH funds its work? Because I think the NIH looks a lot more like those systems that were set up um, than you know, the Rad Lab and the Radio Lab look like anything that's sort of going on right today. Um, and they also talked a little bit about, <laughs> pause, last thought. They also talked a little bit about uh, in one of their papers, you know, how the Manhattan Project is really the memorable project. And so I started thinking about how memory is created the way it is, but I wanted to pull up these slides sort of for my last thought just to give you a sense of what the influence of investment in nuclear energy and nuclear warfare was as compared to some of the other things. So you can see um, that the top technology classes with uh, OSRD patents, like the top technology class here um, with a high percentage of the patents is um, nuclear and x-rays, and I don't know how much that also includes uh, radar, but certainly nuclear energy. Um, and then if you look also here um, in the more detail, you see that nuclear reactors are really being driven by OSRG. Nuclear energy is really being driven by OSRG. Um, and so I think that there's, there's also a story here of how certain kinds of technologies are ripe for investment and translation into civilian technologies. And some technologies, no matter how much money you pour into them, are just not ready for civilian takeoff. And nuclear energy is one of those things that we put a ton of money into, we continue to spend a ton of money at our particle colliders on and may do very good science, but is just not a civilian amenable or non-governmental amenable technology. Um, anyways, thank you so much for letting me, me talk about this and giving me an opportunity to read this. Uh, and I really appreciate it.